I'm at Waterhead, just outside Ambleside, at the northern end of Windermere in the English Lake District. 48 hours ago, we started an epic journey from the UK's most easterly bus stop in Lowest Doft on the Suffolk coast. Across the past few days, I've taken 19 buses and covered the best part of 400 miles. On the debit side, Slow Travel Turtle got misplaced somewhere in West Yorkshire. On the positive, every connection has worked and we're exactly on schedule. Now, in the second and final part of this adventure, we're up at 6am on a Wednesday morning to continue our journey towards the UK's most westerly bus stop. Join us as we continue to go west. At the end of day two, we interrupted our journey on the fantastic 555 bus across the lakes as this long haul route stops short at Grasmere once evening falls. After a night at the lovely lakeside youth hostel at Waterhead, I'm up bright and early for the first northbound bus of the day to complete the journey over the pass to Keswick. For now, as we rattle north from Ambleside, the passengers are just me and a friendly black Labrador taking his bleary eyed owner for a walk. The vast expanse of Windermere is followed by two smaller, shallow lakes filling the Rothay Valley. First comes Rydal Water. On a faultless morning like today's, with the sky blue and the fells reflecting in the mill pond calm water, the lake's surface is almost invisible at times, merging seamlessly into the grandeur of the landscape. Five minutes further on, past the tree-obscured shores of Grasmere, we come to the eponymous village, sailing past Wordsworth's Dove Cottage on the outskirts, which, set back only a few metres from the main road, is somewhat less idyllic than when the romantic poet and his sister moved in on the cusp of the 19th century for the purposes of what he called plain living but high thinking. Today's Grasmere, lovely as it is, might not be to his taste, its primary industry being to shepherd a tourist multitude through the cottage, sell them some excellent gingerbread and usher them onwards. It's not a village built for today's traffic, or really for double-decker buses, but at half past six there's nothing to hold up the passage of the 555. Beyond Grasmere, we're climbing to the 238 metre summit of Dunmail Rays, the easiest and lowest route from the southern lakes to the northern ones. This was historically the border between Westmoreland to the south and Cumberland to the north, and at one point was the southern border of the Kingdom of Strathclyde. This pile of stones in the central reservation of the A591 is, according to local legend and a words of poem, the burial cairn of Dunmail, erstwhile King of Cumberland, killed in a battle with Saxon forces on this pass in the 10th century. On the descent from Dunmail Rays, we pass Firlmere, once a natural lake but dammed and hugely expanded in the 19th century to provide water for growing thirsty Manchester. It may look innocuously pleasant today but John Ruskin of course hated it. Manchester, he wrote, in a vitriolic broadside of revenge, can produce no good art and no good literature. It is falling off even in the quality of its cotton. It is cowardly in war and predatory in peace. With morning mist still hanging in the quiet valley of St John's in the Vale and the morning sun illuminating every ridge line on the mountain of Skiddaw beyond, it's now just a short hop over one more hill to Keswick, the largest town of the Northern Lakes. I'm hopping off the 555 at the edge of town, partly because I like the name of the stop, the Trois Dogs Inn, but also because it gives me five extra minutes to decompress beside the beautiful 17th century Calvert's Bridge which once carried a coach road across the River Greta. Away from the idyllic river bank and back on the narrow pavement of the Penrith Road, please enjoy, through the medium of shadow puppetry, my attempt to convey the message of I know I just tried to flag you down, Mr 555 driver, but actually it's the X5 that's right behind you I actually want. It works, but I'm not sure it's going to catch on. It's still early morning and we're heading straight towards the 860 metre high bulk of Blencathra, many kilometres above whose summit, in the blue sky, a procession of airliners from Europe cruise north along the jet corridor towards Prestwick, where they'll make their own westerly turn to begin the transatlantic schlep. Yesterday we caught bus 66, today we're on Britain's real route 66, the A66, 
a great east-west highway that spans both the Pennines and the Lake District Fells on its way from Teesside to the Cumbrian coast. So, speeding along this great east-west artery on the Go West Challenge, we're obviously heading due east. Our whole 40 minutes on the X5 will be heading back towards the Prime Meridian. The topography, the road network, and most importantly, the more frequent and fast buses require us to make quite a little dogleg here. Arriving in the little market town of Penrith, we get our first glimpse of the warm, salmon-tinted Solway sandstone that dominates the architecture of the western borderlands in the form of the town's smart railway station, where we pull up to let no one off and no one on as the trains are on strike today. But at least the station loop gives us a view of the scant but dramatic remains of Penrith Castle, a 15th century bastion against Scottish incursions. If you were worried all my buses seem a bit empty, the 104 is an exception. Our numbers squeezed onto this single decker to Carlisle, probably boosted today by refugees from the strike-bound parallel West Coast mainline. The 104 actually starts at a vast centre parks in Windfell Forest just outside Penrith, which seems to mean it gets a remarkably good timetable, including a daily 1am departure from Penrith to Carlisle. It's a straightforward run north to Carlisle along the valley of the River Petrel. Straight is the appropriate word, because this stretch of the A6 runs directly along the Roman road. Despite being a key route to Lugavallium, that's Carlisle to you non-classically educated types, one of the most northerly towns of the Empire, this Roman road doesn't get a sexy name like Ermine Street or the Foss Way. In the archaeological classification system, it's just plain old M7E. Coming up the old main road from the south, the 104 enters the border city of Carlisle at the English Gate. Despite the warlike appearance of the citadel buildings by the gate, they are actually law courts and prisons designed by Thomas Telford a century after the Act of Union had removed any Scottish threat. But they set the theme for the town, all the attributes of a great city in slightly diminutive form, often in red sandstone. This particularly applies to the city's cathedral in its peaceful cathedral close, which despite having been a bishopric since the 12th century, resembles nothing so much as a large parish church. With three quarters of an hour between buses, there's time for breakfast in the sun-dappled Market Square, which sports an inevitably diminutive old town hall and a replica of Britain's first pillar box, trialled here in 1835 by post office clerk and occasional novelist Anthony Trollope. Fittingly, Carlisle's bus station is diminutive too, with lots of signs telling prospective passengers to wait for some routes on surrounding streets. But the 79 is an important bus, a busy cross-border shuttle, so it gets its own stand. We're delayed a bit while the driver gets his supervisor to come and hit the ticket machine to get it working again, and then we're off, across the flat Solway Moss, where the rivers Esk, Lynn and Eden combine to create the Solway Firth. We charge north on Roman Road M7F, dating from the brief period when the Empire stretched beyond Hadrian's Wall to the Antonine Wall in the Scottish Central Belt. We pass through the last town in England, Longtown, which lives up to its name, then turn west. After several spectacular crossings of vast peat and foam stained rivers on the 79, the near invisible crossing of the Little River Sark, when it comes, is pretty disappointing. Nevertheless, for about five miles, this little watercourse forms the western end of the Anglo Scottish border. We're finally in country number two. Things don't rapidly get more promising. The Welcome to Scotland on the 79 is a circuit round the bins and storage area at the back of Gretna Gateway shopping outlet. Not many eloping Regency couples here, just a rest spot off the motorway to come in search of discounted trainers. Gretna itself, however, is rather nice. A smart, planned town for the various murky munition adjacent activities that these borderlands were home to. Visiting during World War I, Arthur Conan Doyle witnessed the 11,000 strong female workforce needing nitroglycerine and gun cotton to create cordite, which he christened the Devil's Povich. A somewhat less explosive place today, Gretna gives us the first iron brew wielding passenger, a sure sign that we were across the border. After Annan, whose one shelter bus station makes Carlisle's look gargantuan, we cross the River Annan, they won no prizes for originality of town naming here, and are off into the lush, rich Dumfrieshuk farmland. 
Before long, our bus is squeezing down the narrowest of country lanes on an occasional diversion to the single-storey, whitewashed hamlet of Ruffwell. Ruffwell has played an oversized role in the financial affairs of the world. In 1810, the local priest, Reverend Henry Duncan, established what is claimed as the world's first savings bank in his parish, as an attempt to alleviate rural poverty. Account holders were required to deposit four shillings a year and were fined sixpence if they failed to attend the AGM. After 90 minutes of prodigiously bumpy country lanes, the 79 pulls up at its terminus, the White Sands car park, next to the sprawling River Niff in Dumfries. The largest town for many miles around, Dumfries is nicknamed the Queen of the South, also known for its football team. Allegedly the phrase was dreamt up by a local poet, David Dunbar, who wrote it in an election address when he stood in the 1857 general election. A bit better than the usual, only the Lib Dems can beat the Tories here fair. Sadly, I can't actually find any record of Dunbar being a candidate in any published election results, so this may be a bit of a small town urban myth. David Dunbar can't even really claim a high spot in the pantheon of Dumfries' poets, not when there's this chap immortalised in marble outside Greyfriars Church. Robbie Burns is really an Ayrshire lad and only lived in Dumfries for the last five years of his life, working as an exciseman, but they were amongst his most accomplished literary years and the town's taken him for their own. More prosaically, the steps of his statue were the site of a vicious mugging where a seagull got away with most of my cheese sandwich from the baker's opposite. Despite this violent incident, Dumfries is the second delightful town I've discovered today, stuffed with low-key but fascinating history and architecture, including the old mid-steeple building, stuck in right in the middle of the high street. It's 1pm and I'm waiting outside Dumfries' shuttered railway station. It's an appropriate location as my next leg, the 500 to Stranra, is effectively a rail replacement bus. Not due to today's industrial action, but as a substitute for the railway across the southwestern corner of Scotland, which closed right back in 1965. This was officially called the Port Patrick and Wigtownshire Joint Railway, but its colloquial name was the Port Road, because this was the main rail route from England to connect with the steamers to Northern Ireland. Railways in this remote and empty corner of Scotland withered in the face of the beaching report, so now the long cross-country link west from Dumfries is on the 500, which, like many longer routes in Scotland, is a bit of a coach-bus hybrid. The vehicle is certainly a coach, which is great because at nearly two and a half hours this is the longest single leg of our entire journey, so a bit of comfort is welcome. But it will call at any stop and in places any lane end, and you can't book in advance and the fares are bus level. In fact, the fares are a bit odd. A Rover ticket that covers every bus in Dumfries and Galloway for the whole day comes in at £3 less than a single from Dumfries to Stranra, which makes you wonder why the single ticket even exists, beyond trapping the unwary. But anyway, for the purpose of this journey, it's a bus. We started today by a lake. Beyond Castle Douglas, we're passing our first lock, reed-fringed Carling Walk Lock. The 500 service consists of two coaches running to and fro between Dumfries and Stranra, mainly on wide trunk roads. It's pretty unfortunate then to meet the one coming the other way on a very narrow bit of road in Twineholm. All very smoothly handled by our patient driver, luckily. As we roll past the 16th century tower house of Carsleuth Castle, there's the sea for the first time since Lowestoft two and a half days ago, coast to coast and all by bus. 
My favourite fact about the little town of Newton Stewart is that the Wicker Man, the good one, not the Nick Cage abomination, premiered in its tiny cinema in recognition that much of the external shooting actually took place around here in lowland Wigtownshire, not on some remote Hebridean island. Over the scant remains of the old Port Road Railway at Kakawan, then over the bleak elevated bogs of De Skelpin Moss, through the woods at Castle Kennedy and we're at Stranraer. The introduction to the town is a bit melancholy, the levelled expanse of rubble where, until a decade ago, ferries from Northern Ireland docked. Now they've moved further up Loch Ryan to moor at Cairn Ryan, giving ferry passengers a shorter journey but leaving this isolated town at the bottom left hand corner of Scotland even more out on a limb. From the beach you can just make out the white outlines of the ferries as they edge away from their new port, up the lock and towards the open sea. On the waterfront there's still traces of Stranraer's port past, including this diminutive yet monumental wayhouse. Inland, things go downhill a bit, with the main street dominated by the burnt out shell of the George Hotel, which has stood like this for decades. My outlook on the town's not improved by it being half day closing and therefore being unable to test if Gillespie and Sons Craft Bakery really does have the best potato scones in Scotland. But to be fair, things look up as I walk towards refurbished Castle Square. The Castle of St John was used as a government base during the cheerily named Killing Times of the 1680s when the Crown violently suppressed the Covenanter movement. Today it's just a nice place for a very generous but very non-potato scone. I'm going to hazard a guess that by now you've worked out that the UK's most westerly bus stop is in Northern Ireland. Given I can't get a ferry there from Stranraer anymore, that means one last bus trip on the bigger island. Ten minutes on the 360 up the lock to Cairn Ryan. We pass the P&O terminal first, prompting a hiss of there's the rat ferry from some local lads on the bus. The line's recent decision to sack all its crew clearly roar round here. In Cairn Ryan village, there's the remains of the pier of the military port number two, built as an emergency west coast harbour in case Liverpool or Glasgow became unusable due to bombing. Never needed for that purpose, instead it was where parts of the D-Day Mulberry harbours were constructed and where the Atlantic U-boat fleet tied up to surrender. As my moral compass couldn't possibly let me sail on the Rat Ferry, I'm heading for the Stena Line terminal. Some 360 buses serve it directly, but for some reason this one doesn't, despite it connecting well with the evening sailing. It's a 10 minute walk from the bus stop at Burnt Foot Bridge, which starts off as a pleasant lockside stroll watching our ferry, the Superfast 8, reversing into her berth. Then it deteriorates to risking life and limb on horrible pedestrian crossings, narrow pavements and being raced past by HGVs heading for the ship. It's a relief to be in the terminal, checked in, through the very cursory security and heading up the escalator to board the ferry. It sort of counts as a bus, right? The St George's Channel, which we're about to cross, has a bit of a reputation, storm-wise. In 1953, one of the earliest roll-on, roll-off ferries, the Princess Victoria, sank on this route, with a loss of 135 lives. It was the worst disaster with this sort of British ferry until the Herald of Free Enterprise. Sailing on the Superfast 8, I did find myself doing a quick check that its seven predecessors aren't sitting at the bottom of the St George's Channel. No, they're still afloat. Not that there's any need to worry today. Not just Lot Ryan, but the open sea are as flat as mill ponds. An Irish fellow passenger tells me she's never seen it so calm in 50 years of making this crossing. There may be no rocking from the waves, but that doesn't stop the engine vibrations, setting off plenty of car alarms on the vehicle deck as we power out of Cairn Ryan, past the distant extinct volcanic pyramid of Isa Craig, and sweep west for Ireland. There's a real gosh Scotland and Ireland are close aren't they moment to be had on this crossing. On the right that's the Mull of Kintyre, on the left County Antrim looking just a decent jump apart. It's a bit wider where we're crossing but after an hour and a half the Superfast 8 is churning its way up Belfast Luff. That's lakes, locks and luffs all in one day. Sailing up Belfast Loft now, uh, just passing Carrickfergus, 
uh, towards the end of day three we've managed to gather six buses so far there's actually one more still to go uh, this evening um, but it'll be pretty late but i'm going to go fast so i will sign off for the day now seems fantastic places two countries done already one more to do a bit later um, great places i've never been before like dumfries and St. carlisle uh, just discovery knows all what this kind of journey is about so see you tomorrow for the final stage Shamefully, in 40 years living in the UK, I've never set foot in Northern Ireland. Well, there can't be a better belated introduction than a cruise up the Lough in the gloaming, the Belfast Hills dark behind the lights of the city. I promised one final bus of the day, and here it is. A late night extra on the 96 route that comes out specially to connect with the 10pm ferry. Belfast's buses are a fine shade of shocking pink. A cynic might say it was chosen because it's a rare politically uncontested colour in this city. Next stop, Through the vast port and we're soon into the city centre. And as we turn into Donegal Place to terminate, there's the incredible sight of floodlit City Hall square on to our bus. What a welcome to this city. I think I'm going to like Belfast. I'm glad to have a more leisurely start for the final day than for the previous three to give time for a bit of daylight exploration of Belfast. As predicted, I do indeed like this compelling package of a city. The gridiron of New York, the civic buildings of Liverpool, the red brick warehouses of Manchester, the hills at the street ends of Edinburgh, the bright western light of Galway, tied together with the scars of Belfast's unique history. Its city centre feels more cared for and alive than many Big Island equivalents. Is that still a peace dividend, a protocol dividend, or maybe even an online shops won't deliver to Northern Ireland dividend? With no bus to catch until 9.30, there's time to sample the new Belfast. Popping into Maggie May's cafe for a fantastic vegan Ulster fry. There's three words that don't traditionally go together. I don't think Ian Paisley ever opined that Ulster says no animal products. Fortified with scrambled tofu, it's a short walk to the Europa bus station, which lurks under a shopping centre, across the road from the site of last night's libations, and next door to the Europa Hotel, which once claimed to be Europe's most frequently bombed four-star accommodation. We've just under ten hours of travelling ahead, across five of Northern Ireland's six counties, starting here in County Antrim, and all the buses will be in the light blue of Ulster bus, because on this side of the St George's Channel, Buses and trains are nationalised under the umbrella of Stormont Run Translink. This means one ticket on one smart card will cover my entire journey, which starts on this double-decker 551 for the long haul up the Lagan Valley to Lurgan. Within a few moments of pulling out of the Europa bus station, you're getting a glimpse of the stereotypes of Northern Ireland, political murals and segregated estates. Here at Sandy Row, King Billy proudly adorns the end wall of a loyalist estate. And while things quickly go up market, that sets the narrative for this first bus journey. The Lagan Valley is heavily Protestant, and the Belfast suburbs of Windsor and Balmoral are, as you'd expect from those names, bastions of comfortable unionism. It's just past the 12th of July, the anniversary of William of Orange's victory at the Battle of the Boyne, and there's a flag on every lamppost, alternating between the Union flag and the Ulster banner, apart from a bit outside a new development with Barclay Holmes flags. It may be a comfortable looking area, but the police stations do still resemble armed camps. The highlight of this journey out through the suburbs is passing the incredible King's Hall. It could be a Zeppelin hangar plonked down here among the houses. In reality, it's a 1930s agricultural show hall of remarkable size. Without breaking free of the Belfast conurbation, we're arriving into smart Lisbon. Like many of the towns in this valley, this was a town that got prosperous on linen. In fact, Lisbon claims to be the birthplace of the Ulster linen trade. At the end of the 17th century, Huguenot refugees arrived and modernised the rudimentary extant manufacturing. And 
Another feature of July in Unionist Northern Ireland are the orange arches with lodge insignia, pictures of the Queen and King Billy and the like erected over the main roads. Luckily, they've built them high enough for a double-decker bus to pass easily under. Beyond Lisbon, we finally break free of the merged towns of the Lagan Valley into unmistakably Irish countryside. And at the town of Moira, we dip briefly into County 2 of the day, County Down. There's not many passengers on our double-decker, but it's a friendly old bus. And by the time I get off, I know lots about the tribulations of my fellow passengers' aunt's dogs, who is coming on a day trip to Warren Point, and that I missed a grand night at the Legion yesterday evening with some great crack. All right, so that means they usually like to see very long as you're responsible for any We pass under the grandest orange arch yet as we arrive in Lurgan. The town itself is almost two-thirds Catholic, but there are segregated Protestant estates at this southern end of the town. Lurgan's central layout is one I'm becoming familiar with in these plantation towns, the settlements that arose from the so-called plantation of Ulster Scots here at the turn of the 17th century. Most of these towns feature a very broad main street, Market Street in Lurgan, leading to a church with straight planned streets leading off either side. We may have crossed into County Free, County Armagh, but we're still in the land of linen and Market Street is now dominated by a modern sculpture of linen bleachers. There's still sectarian tensions here, but the old murder triangle of Lurgan, Craigavon and Porterdown is no more. And this is a nice place to while away half an hour in the warm sunshine. So much so that I let the first 46 go and waited 20 minutes for the next one. It's only a few miles to Porterdown, but the 46 conspires to make the most of it with some elaborate loops around the new town of Craigavon, plonked down between Lurgan and Porterdown in the 1960s. At one point, all three were supposed to become a single linked town called Craigavon, but things stalled a bit, so it's just the new town that took the name. A mix of run-down 60s blocks and very new build, but at least with lots of open space. The first Irish trickleurs of the journey flutter above some of the houses here. The naming itself was somewhat controversial, commemorating Viscount Craigavon, the first Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, and staunch Unionist who threatened armed insurrection to prevent home rule. Half an hour of estate looping later, we're in Portadown, another plantation town with very similar features to Lurgan, but where the demographics are switched. Here, nearly two thirds of the population is Protestant. Our next bus, the 75, is another smart new Ulster bus single-decker heading for Dungannon. Sometimes you see a bus stop name on a timetable and wonder, is that the same place as? This very ordinary looking street is the Garbaki Road, which in the 1990s was the scene of an annual standoff, often ending in violence, when Orange Order members sought to march through this Catholic part of overwhelmingly Protestant Porter Down on their way back from Drum Cree Church on the Sunday before the 12th of July. The Garbaki Road march has been banned by the Parades Commission since 1998, but tensions festered on for several years afterwards. When the Orange Lodges started marching to and from Drum Cree in the early 19th century, the Garbaki Road was farmland, so sectarian issues barely arose until many decades later as Portadown expanded. Out into the farmland and the 75 has become a rural bus. As we head west through Northern Ireland, the buses are getting a bit less frequent on each route, and they are all pretty quiet, but I've managed to pin together a pretty efficient cross-country journey from the sparse schedules. A slight disappointment here is that although the 75 runs right next to the largest lake in the British Isles, Lough Ney, it's a low-lying lake in a low-lying area, so it's very much a case of blink and you miss the views. 40% of Northern Ireland's water comes from this vast inland lake. We're over the border into county number four now, Tyrone. Along with neighbouring Fermanagh, Majority Catholic Tyrone was a highly contested borderland at the time of partition. In 1918, Winston Churchill bemoaned that, as the deluge of world war subsided, the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone were emerging once again. In other words, the age-old Irish question was re-entering British politics. As an excellent steeple as we enter Dungannon, I'll let you be the aesthetic judge as to dreariness. Dungannon is a hilly town, with the bus station, full of buses if not of passengers, at the bottom of the hill, where the railway station's goods yard used to be. In 1950, the Stormont government slashed the rail network to a skeletal remainder, leaving buses the only form of public transport for much of the six counties. 
Indeed, two of those counties, Tyrone and Fermanagh, were left without a railway station between them. It's a solid climb from the bus station up to the sleepy centre of Dungannon, perched on the hilltop around its long market square, at the top of which is the town's grand turreted police station, resembling more a small Scottish castle than a Tyrone cop shop. Luckily, my next bus, the 86 to Omar, serves the market square as well as the bus station, so no need to descend again. Quite a surprise that this bus, for most of whose journey I'm the only passenger, turns out to be a rattly old double-decker. Tyrone countryside is stunning and idyllic, the sort of idealised landscapes one might build for a model railway, and then close the railway down obviously. The only downside to this delightful journey is the road surface appalling and the bus suspension non-existent. For the first time on the journey, filming is becoming a bit of a challenge. And the drama doesn't stop there. Just as we pull into Carrick Moor, the bus hits a large semi-detached tree branch very hard, smashing the offside upstairs window, making me feel very grateful I chose the seat opposite. We limp on into Carrick Moor village, ancestral home of Kirk Cobain, and the driver wearily comes upstairs. After a bit of prodding of the glass and some unfocused blasphemies aimed in the general direction of Fermanagh and Omar District Council, he decides we're fit to plod on for the remainder of the journey. It's a fine arrival into Omar's bus station, over the River Strudel, with the skyline dominated by the spires of the Sacred Heart Church. I can't really call them twin spires given the size mismatch, and this must be a bad place to live if you're OCD, but Omar is probably the handsomest Northern Irish town I've visited so far. There's a fine neoclassical courthouse at the top of the nicely proportioned Market Street, dominating this bustling county town. But history trips you up here too. A sudden moment of recognition of the streetscape at the bottom of Market Street, despite never having been here before. The glass monument here marks the spot where on the 15th of August 1998, the Red Vauxhall Cavalier in this photograph exploded, killing 29 people in a real IRA atrocity, the deadliest single incident in Northern Ireland of the entire Troubles. Coming after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, the subsequent outrage hastened the weakening of the distant Republican movement, a silver lining to a horrific day. It's just coming up to 4pm and we're on the penultimate bus of our epic journey. Astonishingly, this is the last direct bus of the day from Omar to Enniskillen, neighbouring towns barely an hour apart. As we race down the A42 towards Dromore, through Harvest Time Tyrone, a local lad tries earnestly to pay the fare he says he was let off yesterday. The bus driver is having none of it. Beyond Dromore, we're onto minor roads, twisting through deep and ambulant countryside, gleaming in every shade of green under the sun. Last, there's the first glimpse of the lakelands of our final county, Fermanagh, the reed-fringed inlets of Lower Lough Earn, and we're soon pulling into the bus station at Enniskillen, built to the pebbled ash panopticon style of nearly every Translink small town bus station. 
When I did the Bus 24 challenge, I suggested that Derby might have the nicest setting at the back of its bus station. I'm afraid Enniskillen bus station has taken the UK stakes here, perched on the sylvan banks of one of the channels of the River Urn. Towns don't come much more lovely than Enniskillen, I'm discovering. Its high street, with Catholic and Protestant cathedral churches sitting on either side, runs along the hog's back of a small island. This is a historically strategic site, balanced between Upper and Lower Lough Urn, guarded by the fairy tale Riverside Castle, built in 1428 by a pleasant sounding chap called Hugh the Hospitable. I'm glad to have the best part of 90 minutes to hang out here beside the busy waterways and quickly grab a refreshing one for the final bit of the road at Blakes of the Hollow, a historic pub that, like most of Northern Ireland, was used as a location for Game of Thrones. Every bit of the past four days' journey from Lowestoft was planned around this moment at Enniskillen bus station. I can now reveal that the most westerly bus stop in the UK has just two buses a week, and both of them are on Thursdays. The 64 runs every day as far as Bell Coo, but on Thursdays it becomes the 64B and extends 13 miles further west into the furthest extremities of County Fermanagh to terminate at the border village of Balik. I've been assuming that that little bus over there would pull forward to run this rare service, but Ulster Bus has one final surprise, yet another rather over-generous rural double-decker. With 31 successful connections under my belt, it's nice not to have to worry about the next one as the 64B sits in traffic leaving Enniskillen or gets stuck behind a tractor on the A4. This is Bell Coo, where five days a week this bus terminates. If we carried straight on at this junction, in a couple of hundred metres we'd cross the border into County Cavan and into the Republic of Ireland. But the 64B is swinging right at the last moment, onto the remote B52, to head along the UK shore of Upper Lough McNean. After partition, a commission was established to review the boundary. Under its recommendations, a small number of overwhelmingly Catholic villages, including Belcou and Balik, would have transferred to what was then the Free State. When it was published in 1925, the proposals went too far for Unionists and nothing like far enough for Republicans. The three governments, London, Belfast and Dublin, agreed to take the easy way out and suppress the report. Harrison is the last village before Balik, and from there it's a wonderful run in the evening light over the hills and along empty hedge-lined roads between cow-speckled upland meadows. At just after 7pm we're approaching our final destination. Not Balik village itself, but its primary school, a mile or so to the south and just a teeny bit to the west. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you. So here we are at Balik Primary School, the most westerly primary school in the United Kingdom and also the most westerly bus stop in the United Kingdom, a little over eight degrees west of Greenwich. Now, slight issue. There isn't actually a bus stop here, at least no sign or shelter, um, but it's a stopping point, it's in the timetable, it's marked on Google Maps, so as far as I'm concerned, it counts. Uh, the 64B, the twice-weekly uh, bus, which runs twice on Thursdays, no other day of the week, has just wandered off down there to its penultimate stop. After its penultimate stop, it will then cross the border twice before terminating at Balik, back in County Fermanagh in Northern Ireland. Um, so we got here exactly when we were supposed to. 32 buses ran almost all of them exactly on time. I think there was one connection that was very tight. Everything else absolutely perfect, which is frankly incredible. Uh, in an era of driver shortages, heat, bus cuts and all the rest of it. 
So well done to those bus companies, uh, well done to you for sitting through all this. Um, and as the next bus to Balik is in a week's time, I'm just gonna walk. If you had any doubts that the years long debate about not having a hard border in Ireland was as much about the practicality of day to day life in the borderlands as it was about entrenched political positions, Balik should disabuse them. The only route from the village's primary school to the village centre takes about 15 minutes to walk and crosses an international border, and now the EU's outer border, twice. Sticking up customs and immigration posts would be utterly implausible. Indeed, this is a truly invisible border. I'm crossing from the UK to the Republic of Ireland here, somewhere next to the end of this ruined building, into an important strategic triangle of land that contains the Jolly Farmers Cafe and, perhaps more importantly, a hilltop fort looming over the River Erne. The crossing back from County Donegal into the UK is a lot prettier. It runs right down the middle of the Erne, somewhere near this flower pot, with the buildings of the famous Balik Pottery looming over on the Fermanagh Bank. Solving the problem of what to do when you're on a border of a metric state and an imperial state, this local business, at least, has decided to revert to older measurements. A hundred years and a month ago, Balik was a war zone, seeing the last significant action in the Irish War of Independence, a final doomed attempt to prevent partition. Now it's a quiet border village, though I did think it best not to ask the exact occupations of some of the characters in the bar of the Fiddlestone. It's a beautiful corner of Fermanagh to celebrate ending the journey with a picnic featuring some of the finest local cuisine as the sun sets over the marina. It's been an epic journey and the UK's most westerly village is a lovely place to end it. Something I'm often asked after these journeys is, how much did that all cost? Well, here's a quick day-by-day -day breakdown. At just a touch over £147 for nearly 1,200 kilometres of travel over 32 hours, that probably doesn't count as horribly expensive. It might almost be a bargain. Finding the best combination of rover tickets and point-to-point -point fares is always as much of a challenge as the timetables, and my final bus driver to Balik reckoned I could have knocked five quid off that day's fares. Oh well, consider it a donation to the Ulster Bus Christmas Party. One final little adventure. At Balik, the western extremities of the UK are just a few miles from the Republic's western Atlantic shore, County Donegal narrowing to a six mile or so wide neck here. In order to start my journey home from Ballyshannon in the Republic, this gives me the opportunity to say I've walked across an entire country before lunch. It would be rude not to. Just a touch over two hours from crossing the border, I'm at Mal Quay in Ballyshannon, on the other side of the Republic of Ireland. Sort of. Well, it's tidal water anyway, here at the mouth of the Urn, where thousands emigrated from to the New World. A shorter and less consequential journey for me now. It's time for the bus to start the journey home. Or is it a coach? Frankly, I'm not sure I care. Thank you so much for coming along.